Hello, biologists. We're back. This is Lab 2.08, Part 2. We're going to finish looking at the milk, and then we're going to answer the questions at the end of the lab. The milk now. We know what the indicators look like when they change colors, so we'll be able to tell if there's starch in the milk by using iodine. Add some iodine, and it really just looks the same. A little, little bit yellow. Let's try copper sulfate. Looking for protein here. I added some sodium hydroxide to the solution earlier and let it sit. It's blue now. When we shake it, the milk, which was white before and the copper sulfate was blue, we do see a definite color change here. It's purple now. So there, our indicator, we ask a question of our copper sulfate indicator, and it's saying, yes, there is protein in milk. Iodine says, no, no starch in milk. When we ask a question of Sudan 3, we're asking about lipids. Let's see what happens when we add Sudan 3 to milk. Not really a color change there. It's really just pink. So let's fill in our chart here for the milk. So in the iodine, we didn't really see a color change. So there's no starch because there was no color change. This is going to be evidence for the questions later in the lab. The milk was just yellow. Copper sulfate, we're looking for protein. There was, of course, protein in milk. You can find that out by reading the back of the milk carton and looking at the nutrition label. So yes, there's protein. Yes, there was a color change to dark purple. And Sudan 3, no lipids, no color change. So you can see the milk here in the virtual lab. It's the, oops, the iodine in the milk just made it yellow. Here you see the color change, the copper sulfate, which is blue, turned the milk, which had protein in it, it turned dark purple. So it changed, indicating there is indeed protein in milk. And the Sudan 3 kept its same color. So we know that there's no lipids in skim milk. I use skim milk. That's an important point. If you did this with um, whole milk, you might find a different result. So question seven is which macromolecules were present in the unknown? Remember in the unknown, only the iodine changed color. So we can use that as evidence. The iodine changed to dark purple. The Sudan 3, oops, Sudan 3 and copper sulfate did not change. And you should be writing full sentences. The iodine changing indicates there was starch in the unknown. We ask the iodine a question, is there starch present? The color change indicate the answer is yes. When we ask Sudan 3, is there are there lipids in the unknown? The Sudan 3 said no, it didn't change color. When we ask copper sulfate indicator, is there protein in the unknown? It said no because it did not change color. So we're asked indicators answer yes or no questions in this lab. Sometimes indicators can answer how much of um, a compound is in a lab, and I'll demonstrate a little bit of that later. Which macromolecules were in the milk? Well, let's use evidence from our table. 
Oh, our table got erased. Well, we can write the answer here. The evidence is we saw that the copper sulfate changed color. So copper sulfite went from blue to dark purple, which means there's protein. And the other two indicators, I'll let you write those, did not change. So there was a change in the copper sulfite. It went from blue to dark purple. There was no change in the other two indicators. Nine, what was the role of the water in the test tube? Well, I have a picture of iodine here. The water is used as a comparison. Iodine's pretty dark, but when you put it in a solution, it's going to dilute a little bit and the color is going to change. So when we put, we put it in water as a comparison or a control, water is a control. We just want to see what the indicator looks like when it's diluted. In water, we know there are no macromolecules. It's just plain water. Just plain tap water was used to compare in every um, test to make sure we knew what the indicator looks like when it was diluted, when we knew there was no macromolecule present. So let's look at some other foods. Um, I want you to predict if there are carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids in an apple. So I want you to write your predictions down. We know there's not starch, but do you think there might be other kinds of carbohydrates in an apple? How about protein? Are apples known for their high protein content? How about lipids? Do apples have lots of fat? You write down your own predictions. And then stop the video and we'll then you can look at the label. Here is a nutrition label for an apple that some nutritionists did. Obviously, apples don't come with nutrition labels. It doesn't have any fat. It does have lots of carbohydrates. They're just not in the form of starch. They're sugars and fiber. And apples do have a little bit of protein. Let's predict what's in cheese. Do you think cheese has a lot of carbohydrates? Write down your prediction. You can use your knowledge of food groups to help you make your prediction. Do you think cheese has a lot of protein? How about lipids? Is cheese known for being fatty? May write down your predictions, stop the video, and then we can look at the nutrition label together. Oh, it turns out cheese does have a lot of fat in it. 6.55 grams, you can write that down in your table. Carbohydrates, really not much. Most people don't worry about the carbohydrates in cheese because there's only 0.34 grams. And protein, there is a nice amount of protein in cheese. Okay, write down your predictions for food three. This is Airheads candy. Now remember, carbohydrates include sugars. Do you think there'll be sugar in candy? How about protein in candy? Do you think there'll be fat in airheads? Do your best, write it down, pause the video, and turn it back on and we can look at the nutrition label. Turns out airheads do have fat in them. They also have lots of carbohydrates, even though it's a tiny piece of candy. It's got lots of sugar, so there are lots of carbohydrates, just no starch. And no protein. So for number 11, write down what surprised you about the nutrition information for these free three foods. And also write down how you made your hypothesis. Write down what you knew about the foods and food groups to make your hypothesis, make your predictions about uh, what was going to be in the foods. You who wanted to stay for the bonus round, I can show you a few extra indicators. This is just plain old tap water, but I can show you an interesting thing about the indicator bromethymal blue. If I just put bromethymal blue in regular water, 
it's going to tell me this water is pretty neutral. It has a pH neutral. It doesn't have a lot of acid, doesn't have a lot of base. Brom thymol blue um, can tell you not only a yes or no question, but it can tell you how much acid or base is in water. Mostly it's going to tell you about the acid. Now, this is just plain tap water and it's not acid, but I can make it acid by using my breath. I can blow in carbon dioxide because I respire as an animal. I use respiration to break down glucose into ATP and I produce carbon dioxide. When I blow that carbon dioxide into water, it turns into carbonic acid and changes the pH. So watch closely. What started out blue is now a nice yellow. So indicators can not only tell us a yes or no question, sometimes they can tell us how much by changing from blue to yellow, and they can do it slowly enough that we can kind of tell um, how much acid is there. There are also other pH indicators. We have two clear solutions here. This one's an acid, it's just plain old vinegar. This is phenolphthalein, it's a clear indicator. It tells us if there's base present. Now it doesn't really change in vinegar, but this one with the cap on it is ammonia, and I have a cap on it for a good reason. Ammonia is very dangerous if you breathe it. In fact, it kills farmers in southern Minnesota because it's part of um, fermenting pig manure. So I'm just going to take the cap off very quickly. It's also a window cleaner. And it's a base. Phenolphthalein tells us about base. When I add phenolphthalein to <clears throat> the ammonia, you can see that there's a dramatic color change here. It's turning a lovely shade of pink. And ammonia is such a powerful um, chemical. It's so volatile, it evaporates easily. It can turn pH paper. This is another indicator. It's embedded in some paper. The ammonia can change the color of this pH paper, going from yellow to it'll go to a blue-green color if I just hold it over the ammonia. It doesn't even have to be in the ammonia. It just has to be over the ammonia. You can see the paper if I hold it away, put it in the air, it kind of turns back to its yellow color. If I put it over the ammonia, it goes blue. I'll do it one more time. And if you want to explain, whoops, I touched it with my finger. If you want to explain bromophthymol blue and ammonia, at the end of your lab, you can get bonus points. There it goes to blue. Wave it around in the air, get rid of the ammonia molecules that are sticking to the paper. If I let it sit long enough, it'll go back yellow. So th those are the indicators. Phenolphthalein turns pink in base, stays colorless in acid, and bromophymol blue, which goes from blue to yellow as water turns a little bit acidic. So thanks for coming. If you have any questions, talk to your teacher. Don't forget to put the lab in the Dropbox so you can get credit. And if you want to write down those extra bonus points, feel free. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.